Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Grace, and I'm a happy, grateful alcoholic. Hi, Grace. And when I first came on the program 41 years ago, I was five foot seven. Now I'm five foot one and a half. <laughs> That's fast backwards. I know that. So I have to see the top of the of the podium, or I couldn't see who I was talking to. Well, anyway, um, I'm a grateful alcoholic, and I. Uh, my whole background was Presbyterianism, and um, I worked in the church for years, and I went to a Presbyterian seminary, so I know what kind of a building I'm in, whether I know anything about the rest of it or not. But the important thing that happened to me is that uh, when I was 31 years old, I had cancer, and... Um, the uh, doctor said gave me six months to live, and um, didn't look very appealing. I had two darling children and a nice husband, and and uh, so they said uh, that finesse. I didn't. I never had drank. I never smoked. Had a good education. I taught um, school in Beverly Hills High School, which was great. It was a lot of fun. That's practice teaching. And um, I had an invalid mother. And the only reason I bring her up is that uh, I was born in Seattle, started school here. And one of the cute things about school here was that my neighbor was um, had two daughters. And their names was Caroline and Gladys Knott. And um, when I went to California... Why, the only people we knew there was the Knotts, the um, nieces and nephews and so forth, the Knotts Berry Farm. But that was a wonderful uh, introduction to California. They had wonderful berries and wonderful pies. And and uh, so in the beginning of California, why, I was kind of in, but I met the cousins here and went to school with them that one year. So anyway, I... Um, didn't get back to Portland until 93. Thank God. I love every snowflake, every raindrop. If you're in California for 50 years, let me tell you, this looks wonderful. I always envisioned heaven to be all white, you know, pure. You haven't had much snow yet, so it hadn't been pure yet. But anyway, <laughs> the... um the background of uh, my getting into Alcoholics Anonymous or even drinking when they said I was going to die, some jerk came to see me and he said, you never smoked? You never drank? No. Well, you're going to die in six months? Yeah. Well, why don't you do it? <laughs> <laughs> so Grace he brought Grace a bottle of Old Forester, and I took a drink, and I kind of didn't think it was so bad to die. And for 11 years, I drank Old Forester straight, water back. I can say it faster than I can say my name. I ordered it for 11 years and drank it for 11 years, and it appeased my thinking I was going to die. Well, obviously, I didn't die. <laughs> and, but I'll tell you, at the end of of the, the 11 year of drinking, my second husband, first husband was a um, real nice guy, had children by him too. The important thing about him was that I have a son and a daughter from him. And that son, this next Monday, will have 36 years on the program. Now, neither one of us have drank. We didn't go out and come in. In my day, that wasn't in. You didn't do that. You listened to your sponsor, and you said, aye, aye, captain. 
And when she said jump, I said how high. And on top of that, um, the important part about her was that she was a friend of Bill W. And so I got wonderful, wonderful um, opportunity, which I value today, of course, very much. But anyway, to get back to my drinking, my, I married a second time, and the, the second husband was a, a flyboy. He owned a non-scheduled airline. I had a very large business, an international business, and I wanted to take flying lessons. So I had been a race driver in 19, gosh, whatever. Um, I drove one of uh, race cars around Ascot down south, and Ernie Triplett owned the cars. If you're old, well, I don't think there's anybody here old enough to remember him. <laughs> anyway, I'm older than God. Anyway, um, he, uh, uh, so I, I was kind of bored. Now it's pretty hard to say in your, have a big corporation that you can be bored, but I was. And, uh, and drinking. So I went out to learn how to fly. And I met the owner, of course, and, the, and ended up owning it myself. He drank himself out of his share of the airport to me. So I owned an airport. Well, then came Korea, and he went to, he went to, um, Korea to, to he was a flyboy. He flew over enemy lines and brought the wounded and dead back at um, dusk. And if you don't know how to handle blood and you don't have, know how to handle people that are injured, um, you can lose yourself in drink. And of course he did. And he came back and he was a total alcohol. So we went to the doctor and the doctor said, What's he doing? And I said, well, I'm buying him all the scotch he can drink. He said, you're killing him. No, I'm not. I love him. Oh, no. What'll I do? Stop drinking. Me? Stop drinking? He's dying. I'm not dying. (laughs) (laughs) It didn't seem fair. Well, it really wasn't fair. But anyway, so I stopped and he stopped. And the next thing... He went out again. I said to the doctor, okay, well, I'm all Irish, so you, that may help you understand my attitude. I looked at that doctor, and I said, he's drinking. I'm not drinking. He said, well, if you stop drinking, he may stop. Well, he did, and I did. And then the first thing came up why he drank again. And while he was overseas, and I was drinking, of course, because he wasn't home, grieving, you know, uh, Air Force wife, and um, I wasn't doing myself any good. Now, if you realize, Old Forester is a pretty good whiskey, and it's pretty strong, and I drank two-fifths a day, every day. Um, I was in this business, uh, it was the flower business, and it was international. My father had started it, and uh, it was a family business. And I had a wonderful office. It was beautiful, Beverly Hills. And I had a, a desk that was like this, was around me. And I had to push a little door, and on the other side was a refrigerator. And with ice cubes, of course, and my old Forester. Or I could press a button and get one of two male secretaries, male, you understand, secretaries, and they would come and pour me a drink from the other side of the refrigerator. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, uh, I was pretty well soaked. But <laughs> by the time I got, uh, I left the office each day, I had drank a fifth of whiskey. Old Forster Strait. And uh, I drove two freeways and never was picked up. 
never was in an accident, never had a DUI, not even a parking ticket. So, of course, I thought I was free. You know, nothing ever happened. I was, it was good. So, uh, and when I went out to, to fly in this guy's, um, at this guy's field, he was an alcoholic. And um, we didn't drink until 5.30 in the afternoon. And uh, then we drank every night. He drank scotch, which was wonderful, because then he didn't get any of my old Forrester whiskey. <laughs> so anyway, he went overseas, and when he came back, why, there he was, dying. And I, it was hard to believe. And I looked at my doctor, who was a family doctor, and I said, I can't believe this. Well, we both stopped drinking, and he started drinking it, you know, after we had both stopped, and the doctor said, you're going to have to divorce him. He's not going to stay stopped. So um, I, I was furious. All the Irish came out, which is not very difficult for me. Um, being all Irish, I've kind of babied my Irish so I could keep my temper and have things my way. Why not? And um, we're kind of finaglers, and that's neat. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, when uh, I he told the doctor told me that I was going to have to divorce him, it was my fault he was dying. He pointed right at my nose, which is an appreciable size, and he said, "You're going to have to do this, or he'll die." So knowing that I loved him, knowing that it was my fault, I divorced him. Well, um, that was May 12, and this was uh, 1957. And when he stopped and I lost him, he divorced, we divorced, I divorced him. Uh, I never had another drink, and I haven't had another drink. But I didn't have AA. There, there just wasn't, I never heard of it. Um, uh, we were separated until New Year's Eve in 1957, and uh, I just lived. You know, when you love somebody and you've worried about them in the service and you, um, your kids loved him, you had a fun life, it just it cut your heart out. And I was nothing. I wasn't happy and I wasn't unhappy. I was just, mm, I got up in the morning, I did whatever I had to do, and my business was good, and that was it. So New Year's Eve came, and I, I had a, <laughs> a nice man take me to a New Year's Eve party, of course. Being Irish, I wasn't going to sit at home, <laughs> and, uh, and I never have sat at home. My first engagement in life was when I was 14, and he was 17. That was the first engagement. There were four more before the first husband. Uh, anyway... <laughs> Somehow, my father had nine brothers, so there's always men around. I could understand them. I couldn't understand this. Oh, you look so sweet. And you're such a nice lady. Or you're such a cute girl. Or would you come to my birthday party? That was, you know, not my cup of tea at all. I went to the football games and I sat with my father and, yeah, and we watched, um, wrestling and boxing and my dad was a sports promoter, too, and he played um, football for University of Washington. That's where he met my mother. And um, so we were involved in sports. But anyway, so here I am waiting to take this nice guy. and I was wearing a nice dress and blah. And um, the doorbell rang, and it was my ex-husband. The guy I divorced for drinking. And I said, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to see me. 
He says, well, I know some people I'd like you to meet. And uh, I said, what kind of people? He said, well, I want you to meet them. And he was sober as a judge. He was handsome. He looked great. I never hadn't seen him in years look like that. Anyway, so I called up the guy and said, I'm sorry. And I hung up the gown. He says, you're going to meet some people. And I said, okay. So I didn't know what to wear. I didn't know, you know. So I put on a New Year's Eve. I put on a nice black dress and uh, high heels and white gloves and a hat. And um, <laughs> and he takes me to Al-Anon. <laughs> New Year's Eve. Well, you can imagine this Irishman. Holy moly. Anyway, and it met in a veterans hall, and here were these house bras in house dress type thing. And I walked in with, and I had a, I had a 18 Tiffany set diamond brooch on. And they're looking at me like, you know, where did this come from? And I'm looking at them, where am I? And um, I sat down, and my ex-husband went into the meeting. And after they opened the meeting, he came in and said, how are you doing? I said, horrible. I don't belong here. And um, it, he gave me 20 questions. You know that card? And in the bottom it says, if you answer three that you're an alcoholic. I read, of course, being an Irishman, maybe in quotes cheat, I read the bottom first. So I went down 17. I was going to get out of there some way. I couldn't stand these looks. Anyway, so he took me to the AA meeting, and where he was. And there were um, 30 men, and four other women, and they were elderly, like I am now, and dull, and uh, showed me nothing. But the 30 men, some of them I knew, they were professional people, but in the area where this was, it was Pasadena, California, and um, they only had one meeting in the whole area a week, a day, and this was... Uh, a Friday night meeting. And so um, I looked around, and I was naturally noticing the men. And um, the first thing that was said when the meeting uh, started was, um, this is to the newcomers. Sit down and shut up. What you know got you here. What we know will keep you here. And that was it. Well, I looked around, and I saw the big book, and I thought it was the Bible. Well, it is our Bible, but I thought it was, you know, the Holy Bible. And I thought, boy, am I going to tell them. And uh, I'd been in seminary, and so just for my own edification, I wanted to know what the heck a Presbyterian was, why they were different from Baptist or... Uh, Congregationalist or Episcopalian, I didn't understand. So I went to seminary to find out. I'm not a minister. Obviously. But anyway, um, so I sat down and I shut up. I didn't say a word. And um, so uh, I looked around and I picked out of the men, I picked 12 men that looked interesting and I took one of each um, for sponsors, one for every step. <laughs> and, uh, well, I'm Irish, you know, you're not supposed to do things the way anybody else does. And I didn't know I didn't. So I, I had a big home. I had a, uh, a good fortune behind me. And I drove up in a new Cadillac. And the diamonds, as I told you. And um, and we had a bar in our home. I mean, a full-blown bar. 
it, um, over the bar had been the cups of the guys in my husband's squadron, the mugs, and uh, I had a butler and a uh, maid, of course. They were married. And um, he would be a bartender other than one day a week when it was his day off. I would call the, the um, bartender's union and have them send out an Irish bartender because they had the best jokes. <laughs> and, and all this time I'm raising a real decent family. I have a nice daughter and a, a lovely son. And how that ever happened that I, that my occupation and my endeavors didn't affect them other than my son is, uh, as a, is a recovered alcoholic. But anyway, so when I got on the program, I couldn't have a bar in my house. So I made it a coffee bar. And I invited a couple of these guys over each evening to entertain me. And, um, and nothing really happened other than laughing and fun. Uh, and that's been my whole AA understanding. The biggest thing I laugh at is me. I can look at, I can look in the mirror now and compare me with when I was a youngster. And I mean in my teens, starting at around 14. I was a fashion model, and um, uh, I uh, was a chorus girl in the back line because I was five foot seven. Couldn't get that in the front line. So my father never knew that. My mother knew it. But my father would have gone bananas. But I had a wonderful time. And, of course, I've always had a good time. I can't say that that just because you're an alcoholic, you have to sit in the corner, because you don't. You just don't drink. You have fun without drinking. Anyway, so as um, I went to this meeting, and I'd have these a few of these guys come over. I'd call them up maybe at 2 o'clock in the morning. And the wife always answered the phone. No man ever gets up in the middle of the night to answer the phone. And she'd say, yes. And I'd say, put, you know, Joe Blow on the line. Well, he's in bed. Tough stuff. I said, get him up. He said, call him anytime. <laughs> well, he's saying, great. I'm in my pajamas. I said, well, what the heck? Pull on some pants and get over here. I want somebody to talk to. Well, I had a heck of a good time. For the first year, I wasn't allowed to say anything, thank God. Because when we came on the program, uh, the first year you didn't say anything because you didn't know anything, really. And uh, so after a little while, after the year was pretty near over, one of the women uh, who had 12 years on the program, um, and pretty serious woman uh, solicited me to sponsor me. And um, she was a friend of Bill Wilson. And um, that's how I happened to get to meet him. And she said, you <laughs> have to do a lot of things different. Well, I didn't know what she was talking about. Um, I sure wasn't a Puritan. And um, so anyway... Uh, she said, we're going to be friends for a year and see if we work out together. So, which was sensible and reasonable, and I still <laughs> am behind that. And at the end of the year, she said, um, we can be sponsor and sponsee, but we do it my way. And her way was at the altar in the church. And we went to this church with, that had a a um, open chapel at night and nobody was there but us and we got on our knees and I pledged to be a good AA baby and she pledged to do her best for me and we did it 
in front of God and in a church. And it was neither one of our churches. It happened to just be an open chapel. And then she took me over. <laughs> and then I had to do things. Um, she said, we'll do it my way. And I said, I, I tapped it. And so she had me go through the AA book. And she had me do things that people today don't do. My girls do. But you can bet. I take it out on them. You know, I had to do this. By golly, you're going to have to. And I have 17 gals that I sponsor. And the youngest of which will have, um, in April, will have 19 years. And the longest timer... In June, 16th of June, we'll have 39 years. None of them went out. And there's 17 of them. And they're all over the country. Because when I started talking, as you can tell, I'm used to talking. It's like, you know, shut her up. (laughs) um, But it's exciting. Just think, 17 gals... um, Wonderful. They never had to go out again. They've, they've got good lives. There's a couple attorneys. There's several nurses. Uh, there's a, a medical doctor. They're from all different walks of life. Wonderful ladies. And families. And um, I'm so blessed. Uh, if you think that Alcoholics Anonymous is downbeat or uh, trash under the chair or whatever, you've got a wrong idea. Because it opens the door to God as you understand him. It opens the door to put your hand in some other person's hand and lead them where you've been and then go on together. This is not a I, me, and mine thing. This is getting to know each other and then with hands together going along life's path. And that's what's beautiful. But anyway, uh, the, I kept going to the meetings and accumulating women. Well, when, when I had two and a half years on the program, a gal said to me, um, I'd like you to sponsor me. So I said to my sponsor, I think I know enough. She said, no, you don't. <laughs> Five years before you sponsor anybody. So I said, I, right, I, right, Captain. And the gal didn't get another sponsor. She waited for me for two and a half years. She's the one that's going to have 39 years. And um, and she never went out again. And um, so that kind of started um, the progress of holding your hand out to somebody else, a hug, a call in the middle of the night, um, when their kids were sick, um, being Johnny on the spot, my relative is here, and he's drunk, and he's all over everywhere, getting some guy to come with you and help him out. And then there are other things that happen, such as, I thought I was so smart. Oh, ego. Woo! And um, one night I got a call from one of the gals I was helping. And she, uh, she said, was crying. And she lived on the wrong side of Los Angeles, um, the east side. Now, that was where the slums were. And now here I am uh, in a new Cadillac, and I find this place where she is. She wanted to go to a meeting, and it was down a dark alley, and a new Cadillac? Oh, my. Well... A back stairs, and I went up, and I heard her crying upstairs, and it was a double stairway. And on the landing was her husband, drunk or in a skunk, with a gun, and um, she was upstairs crying. She wanted to go to a meeting. Well, I should be bothered with a guy with a gun. Ha! Huh. I just walked right past him like I had good sense. (laughs) You know, God's going to be with me. 
Well, he was. Because <laughs> I got the, the gal, walked right past him again, and we went to a meeting. Then I tell him, I tell my sponsor, and I tell him what I did, and they went, oh, Lord, Grace, you know, you, you've lost it. <laughs> no. No, I got the gal. Well, then I learned that you don't go by yourself to do 12-step work. And uh, you do, women don't go in with new cars down in the bottom of the bucket places. I learned, but I had to learn the hard way. Just because I was forward and am, as any fool can play with me. Anyway, um, the, my sponsor, being a friend of Bill Wilson's, in 19... 19- 60, there was a convention in Long Beach, California. And he came out, of course. He and Sister Ignatius came out to speak. And um, my sponsor, of course, knew him. And so I thought I was pretty smart. Uh, of course, as any you can see that too. And um, I started rewriting the book. Now, I had three pages grammatically correct. I was an English teacher, you see. And so I was going to do my bit. And I... <laughs> dear God. And so um, when I had this audience, I call it, with Bill W., um, I take my three pages and I tell him what I'm doing. And he looked at me real sweet, real quiet, and he just tore him up. <laughs> And he said, there's nothing wrong with the way the book is. It's the way it's supposed to be. It's doing its job. We have so many thousands now. I think it was 8,000 or something like that. People then around the world on AA. And I was mortified. Oh, and I was infuriated and hurt. And, you know, I didn't know whether I wanted to kick his ankle or biff him or whatever. Anyway, so fortunately I did nothing. Anyway, um, but I got a chance to meet him. And um, then I moved from the Pasadena area to uh, Laguna Beach. And I moved in behind Chuck Chamberlain, who wrote the new pair of glasses. Well, anyway... My ex-husband, the third husband, they're all dead and I didn't kill anyone. <laughs> um, he, he went with Chuck Chamberlain to a religious science seminary. And my third husband became a minister of the gospel. Chuck didn't finish, but he got a doctorate for writing the new pair of glasses. But my husband was a minister of the gospel, and he died in 1980 with 35 years on the program. Never went out. And uh, the second husband, who were still all friends, uh, birthdays and Christmas and Thanksgiving, we all met together. Nobody had any harsh feelings. We all tried our best. Nobody was angry at anybody. Um, I don't understand this. Oh, my ex-husband is an SOB. Uh, he wasn't when you married him. Maybe you did it. Who knows? <laughs> so we, we were, um, it was a happy, my life hasn't been, oh, woe is me stuff. It's been fun. It's still fun. I get a big kick out of people not knowing that I have any time on the program and looking innocently Oh, really? Oh, my. AA's been there for you. Hmm. Anyway, so (laughs) when I was 42 is when I came on the program, and um, my sponsor really had me into things. One of the neat things, and I don't know whether you thought of it or not, but... uh, we had uh, a AA central office in Los Angeles, which was at that time the only one in California. And then, of course, other uh, places sprung up with 
with uh, central offices. They had them in real estate, back room in drug stores, because they couldn't afford to hire, you know, special plays. So I had a business, and I couldn't um, take time off to work in central office. So she, <laughs> talk about having a sponsor with a know-it-all. She um, said, when they take a vacation, which would be for two weeks, why you fill in? And, of course, without remuneration of any kind, but you get to learn what's going on. And I met all the big shows. We came to California. Everybody wanted to be in California, at least have a vacation. And I met them all. It was wonderful. And at, at that time, Cliff Walker, who started the AA in Los Angeles, and his wife, Dorothy, who was uh, al I got a chance to know personally. I got a chance to know these people and take them home and have dinner. and um, Just fantastic. Um, it was so good that I was kind of scared to breathe for a, that I messed things up. I was careful of what I said. Well, the next thing she said, my sponsor told me was you're going to work in hospitals. Well, okay. So where did she put me in? L.A. General Hospital. Well, I'd never been in that kind of a hospital before because it got everything all from the wrong side of the track, mostly. And I was to call on women, alcoholics, that were in the hospital. And um, my first call, I was 44, and I called on a woman, 44, an alcoholic woman who was dying of alcoholism. And she was admitting from every... So every part of her body and crying. She'd been a very wealthy woman and they kicked her out because of her alcoholism. Remember, don't do that. Anyway, there she was and I, two years on the program, I didn't know what the heck to say to her. But, um, the religious part came in, the Presbyterian part and the feeling sorry for her and thinking she's my same age. We were both 44, and I held her as she died. And if you think that doesn't really ring a bell and has all the rest of my time on AA, you don't forget. And that wasn't the only thing. The um, men called on men, and women called on women, unless there weren't enough men or enough women. And then we called, the women would call on the men. In... uh, Los Angeles General Hospital. We took cigarettes and lifesavers and to the guys that were um, in bed in General Hospital. So I one time I called on this Irish guy, and um, he uh, uh, was tall, evidently from the amount of the uh, bed he took, and um, blue eyed red-haired. He was 25. And um, I'd bring them cigarettes. Now, they told me I could take them cigarettes and candy and um, lifesavers. And I didn't know, with all the money in the world, I didn't know that you gave them each a package. I brought a carton to each of them. (laughs) You talk about having... (laughs) Well... So when people say, what kind of experiences have you had on the program? Holy moly, it's been something. I have a real education in (laughs) alcoholic uh, recovery, believe me. Anyway, he had wine sores on his leg, emitting a black fluid that was obnoxious. And he said, Grace, I want to tell you something. They're going to take me and cut my legs off. They can't save me. Here's this big, tall Irish youngster. And it just I just couldn't stand it. Um, I got down to my car. I couldn't have driven. I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. Well, the next week when I went to the hospital, 
he was in care. And that, it just deguts you. It just, that was the end. I just hardly could stand it. Well, just to pick that up, a year later, uh, I went to meetings in Pasadena, and I had told them all about our meetings, so that when they came out of the hospital, they had a place to go. And the guys would come and pick up the guys, and the gals would come and pick up the girls and take them to the meetings. Well, a year later, I went into this meeting in Pasadena, California, and um, out of the shadows of this mission-type women's club where the meeting was, stepped a man, and that was him. He had lost his leg. Gives me chills today. There he was, tall, handsome, and he made it. And I, and we sat and held each other and cried the whole time. I don't know who spoke or why they spoke or how they spoke, but and I never saw him again. That was my reward for listening. When you say, well, I know as much as my sponsor, or I know what better to do, bull. Um, thank God that I had learned that what I knew was really nothing compared to what my sponsor knew. Well, anyway, if, um, neat things happen. Where is the clock here? <laughs> anyway, they, I usually bring a little clock, but I didn't. Dennis will hit me over the head when it's time anyway. So anyhow, is there a clock here? Of it. Of all the crazy things that happened to me, and all the time somebody sat on my head and told them, you know, Grace, don't do that. And most of the time, I listened. I can't say totally because I made a lot of mistakes. Like taking a woman's husband to a meeting. She was a school teacher and she had papers to do that night. And I took her to the meeting in uh, Hollywood, California. Was being at Plumer Park. It's not there anymore. We had 450 people every Sunday night, and uh, there were movie actors and actresses there. It was the motion picture group, and I thought it was kind of funny. This guy had to get up and go to the men's room all the time, and it got more frequent. And I thought that's kind of weird. He must have some kind of a kidney problem. Well, we got in the car to go home, and all of a sudden he gets amorous, and I'm driving. He ran in, he ran me into a streetcar. Well, of course, I told her she didn't hate her husband. It's a wonder we came out alive. But I, next time you need, he needs to go to a meeting. You take him. That was the end of that. So I learned you don't take single men. But even, you know, I mean men by themselves, unless you have their their uh, wife or their son or somebody, you just, even though I was, oh, I'd say five or seven years older than he, didn't make any difference to him. Amherst goes, you know, well, and it was the motion picture group, so I dressed up. I wasn't going to look like, you know, somebody old day and anyway I never did that again the uh, and as time went on uh, every time Bill Wilson came to California well he stayed with Chuck who lived right across the street from Jack Hamilton and me and Jack Hamilton was 12 years on the program ahead of me I met him first when I was two years and you know how guys are new gals coming into a meeting Woo! Um, can I take you there? There's some speaker over here. Anyway, I married him. <laughs> so then I didn't have to worry who was speaking here or speaking there. He was in the bed next to me. Anyhow, um, and he has a son who's on the program, and my son is a sponsor of his son, although he, uh, Jack Hamilton is now dead. 
and he died with 35 years on the program. The important part of all of it is I listened. How that happened, God only knows. Um, for me to listen, and me to sit in a meeting and hear somebody say something that isn't in the book, or isn't right, or I've experienced differently, I want to get up and yell. You stupid jerk. You know, or jerk us. <laughs> <What a, laughs> and one of the neat things that maybe you'll remember and maybe you'll do is my sponsor had me write a card you know, a little three-by-five time, um, every day. I read and have read a page a day every day that I've been on the program. Now, uh, that's 15,444 days, and I have a card for every day, and I give them out. No use keeping them, and people will ask me for my card for that day. It has... How many times I have gone through the book, 88 times, 164 pages, um, and the page today, I'm back at the, in the foreword, and what I have picked out on that page that means something to me. Uh, Today's AAs don't have a program, and that's a neat one. You just buy three by five cards, read a page a day, write it down, and carry it all day, and if somebody wants it, you give it to them. And that's a good deed today. And it's so easy. And you get to, you know, it to be just a program that you just keep doing. So she had me do those kind of things. Another thing she said, you go through the book, the 164 pages, and find out how important God is in our program. You write the page number, the quote, underline God on each each page that it is, there is God, and there's 272 God in 964 pages. There are 61 pages that have God on them. And I carry them with me. So she had me do that with acceptance, with selfishness. I had to work to get on the program. You can't just come in and sit down and have a coffee, and, hi guy, hi girl, and expect to really have something to give. Something inside you, something in your gut. But you know that if you can do it, if you can stop drinking, if you can be important to yourself, your family, and somebody else. If it's just one person, it doesn't make any difference. One person is important. And that's exactly what we're about. And so I have 41 years of doing that. And uh, it's, Im- it's important to me, whether you care or not, that's a number to you. To me, it's my life. Now, I didn't stop working. I didn't stop going to hospitals. I worked two and a half years in a mental institution with the women who were slightly um, off normal from drinking. Many of them graduated from there and went on and were normal people. Many of them didn't make it. But I went, and three days a week, eight hours a day. And I did that because at the time... I was recovering from total paralysis. And that was the only thing I could do for AA that was special. Just go and visit those guys. You gotta think of somebody else. You have to have guts <coughs> to do it. Some of the things that are asked of you, I mean, you have to say no. But mostly, you have to love yourself so you can love everybody else. You have to have fun. And my background and my program is on page 16 in the book. There's a vast amount of fun about it all. That's my mind. And on page 132 in the book, it says we're not a dull group. We aren't. If you know somebody, we come up and 
wives, husbands, whatever. We love each other, and it means that we love the programs that we see working in each other. This is important. Now, when I came back up here, I don't drive a car. I drove for 67 years. I'm a pilot and still have my license. And, but uh, I was 80 years old. No woman, 80 years old, has a business behind a wheel. <laughs> That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I was driving with my daughter, and we came to one of the bridges, which we have up here. And one bridge went this way, and one bridge went that way. And there was a gray-haired woman in front of us. Well, she didn't know whether she wanted to go right or left. And she came right into the fork of the bridge. And that did it. I looked at that old gray-haired woman, and I thought, I'm 84 years old. I'm 80 years old. And I'm not going to drive anymore. I sold my car. <laughs> now, if I have to go somewhere, I go by cab if somebody isn't kind enough to take me. I get there. I can't walk uphill. I have um, osteoporosis. That's how come I'm five foot one and a half instead of five foot seven. And I have an enlarged heart. Well, you can understand why. I give it away. <laughs> and the, <laughs> the doctor has to laugh when I said, well, where do you think my heart went? She said, well, I don't know. Do you know? I said, sure, I give it away all the time. But if you laugh and you're fun and you can be happy and you can hold your hand out or your shoulder out or both arms out, it's wonderful. And the only other thing that is important is that I have 17 gals and a son that are on the program. And my son is six foot eight. And he's, uh, he hitchhiked all over Europe, visiting meetings. He didn't know the languages. But when you're six foot, at that size, um, people don't bother you. And uh, so he's had that experience. And I've spoken all over the United States and Canada, the Hawaii, and it's uh, been wonderful. It's been nice talking to you. And I hope you stay happy, stay sober, and have fun. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.